Recording. Great. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about now is, I have to move my thing up. There we go. Is non-clinician raters, having non-faculty raters assess clinical reasoning and post-encounter patient notes. And um, I will say much more about this, but first do want to give thanks to all of my many colleagues and collaborators who've worked with me on the series of studies that I'm going to talk about uh, with you now. Couldn't have done it without them for sure. And no relevant uh, anything to disclose, alas. Okay, so the work that I'm going to be describing really started long before the demise of the step 2CS, but it's all the more salient now because without the CS, it really falls upon us to assess the clinical skills of our students and within that also clinical reasoning. Right? So uh, thinking about clinical reasoning or really diagnostic reasoning here, uh, I'm talking about the uh, components of data gathering. Can you get a history, take a history, get, do a physical exam? Uh, something we hope goes on in the brain of our students, then they interpret that information and outcomes, the, the differential, the working diagnosis and plan. And typically we uh, assess that in the context of a note, a patient note. So when we look at the data gathering, typically we assess data gathering in the context of an SP encounter, a standardized patient encounter, and again, the differential and so on in the context of a patient note, frequently assessed by faculty. So um, let me check and ask you here. Let me see if I'm able to do this from here. I should be, all right. Let's do a quick poll. And um, just, are you seeing somebody give me a thumbs up? Yeah, you're seeing the poll, great. So just let me know in whatever context you happen to be in, whether medical students, residents, um, do you assess clinical reasoning through SP and counter notes? I'm still seeing some coming in. I'm going to give it now two more seconds. Okay, so here we have seven people um, using SPs for clinical reasoning pre clerkship. There's some in clerkship, end of clerkship, ASCII, residency, good, other contexts as well. All right, great. So you're, you're using this, at least some of you are doing this. And um, let's ask another question, which is, who scores the patient notes? Okay, so mostly faculty scoring the patient notes. Three people have non-clinician readers and for three people, the notes aren't scored. And let me tell you that we have some ASCIs where they have notes and the notes aren't scored as well. So not unusual. Uh, I would love to hear for, uh, for just for a second from the people who have non-clinician readers, <coughs> excuse me, who those non-clinician readers are. Are they medical students? Are they, uh, who, who are they? So if you have non-clinician readers, could you please um, unmute or uh, actually what would be good is because I can only see a few of you, if you could uh, raise your hand using the reactions thing. So that will bump you up to the top of my screen. Rena, can you see if anybody's raising their hand? Can I see anyone who is no, raising or, or maybe put in the chat if you yes. have a non-clinician raider. Who are your non-clinician raiders? Yeah. Not, not seeing anybody. Not seeing anything yet. Okay, no. so we'll go on and maybe we'll talk about this more later on when we have the discussion. 
Okay, so moving right along. Um, I, I'm, I was always very adamantly opposed to have anybody other than faculty scoring notes, right? I did a pilot about almost 20 years ago, probably, where we had some standardized patients scoring the notes. They had a terrible time even just interpreting the, all of the miscellaneous ways that students wrote things in their notes. Um, plus, they don't have the clinical background to, to judge the clinical reasoning that's in the notes. So I was always very, very opposed to it. So the subtitle of this talk is How Rachel Came to Change Her Mind. Okay? And uh, what happened and, and what we did that really led me to change my mind after being very, very opposed to this. All right. So um, just like uh, many schools have, and you probably have something like this. Also, our school has a clinical performance examination and end of clerkship OSCE, which we've had for over 20 years. Um, most recently, or, you know, for the last 15, 10, 15 years since the USMLE came in, it's been patterned after the USMLE. So that is a 15 minute SP encounter scored by the data gathering portion, scored by the standardized patients, where they take a history, they score a checklist for the history and physical exam. There's a rating scale for communication skills. Then students have 10 minutes to write a patient note. Um, and again, the patient note has always been scored by the physician rater. And usually, uh, originally documentation, differential, and plan. And then uh, since 2012, when the CS put in the diagnostic justification part, we've been looking at that as well. Diagnostic justification is where we ask the medical students to list what are the history and physical exam findings that support a candidate diagnosis that they are offering, part of their differential. Uh, what are the findings of this patient, not in theory, but of this patient that support that diagnosis. So we're going to be focusing on that patient note and scoring that patient note. And in 2012, when the USMLE changed the format of the patient note, we came up with a rubric for scoring the patient note. Um, which would look at the four different components that the CS was looking at. So documentation, differential diagnosis, justification, as we said, supporting findings, and the plan for immediate workup. And you can see here some of what, the, what that rubric looked like. So for example, for documentation, the lowest level would be key history and physical exam findings missing or incorrect. And some of them are there, most of them are there, all the information is present, and so on going down. And over the years, we studied this rubric and how it worked and published a series of papers um, about this rubric. So we're pretty comfortable with this rubric and how it works. And the references for this are, are at the end of the slide. Okay, but what we saw is that scoring these notes took a lot of time. It was really hard to get faculty to be able to do it. We really were only able to get faculty to score the one end of uh, M3 OSCE, right? Our summative OSCE. Um, it took them a tremendous amount of time. It took uh, well over a month to get all of the notes scored. We have 180 students in Chicago. Now we have 300 across all three campuses, but all of this data is coming from the 180 in Chicago. There was no way we could get faculty to score the notes to provide any formative feedback to the students, right? So this is a problem. We're doing a summative assessment on something which we are not really giving them practice and formative feedback on, on being able to do. Well, not only that, but as time went on, our faculty, who are very beloved to me, came up with these more and more complicated rules for how to use the rubric, how to actually operationalize the rubric and score them. Right? And this is in part because we would uh, always split the 180 students, uh, the notes from 180 students among several different faculty. Each one of them did a subset of the notes. So we would train them together how to score the notes to make sure we were training them uniformly. Um, then some of the studies that we did were multi-site studies. So again, there had to be training across sites where we weren't even training them all together at the same time. And so uh, the, our, the faculty developed guidelines of how to operationalize the criteria in the rubric. And some of those guidelines got pretty complicated. And our faculty said to us, you know what, Rachel, can you make us a worksheet 
to for these guidelines that we've come up with that they've come up with right so that we can just go through we have a sort of a checklist of the items that we should be looking for in the note and then the the worksheet will help us figure out what the score should be so i put one of my research assistants on this and what she came up with was an irs tax form all right it was an incredibly detailed form of if this and if we you know, add up the numbers from here and if it's more than seven, do this and if it's less than seven. And I said to her, you know what, if we have such complicated um, procedural rules for how to score, can we, can we take some of this burden off of faculty? In other words, effectively, now we have a checklist on the note. A checklist on the note Maybe, uh, maybe a standardized patient could do that. Okay. So that led to our really looking to see, can we train SPs, can we train non-clinician raters to score these notes accurately and reliably, right? And the comparison we were gonna do was between faculty raters and our non-clinician raters or standardized patients. Um, and skills instructors working in our simulation center. These are EMTs and paramedics. So, uh, so here we go. Can non-clinician raters uh, assess clinical reasoning? That's how we, that's where we got to, right? Now, previous studies that we looked at said not so much, right? So we have um, there were studies looking at non-clinician raters and they said, well, non-clinician raters can, can do checklists, right? They can do analytic instruments like checklists, but those analytic instruments don't track the holistic judgments that faculty make, especially for the students, low scoring students around the cut score, right? But we thought to ourselves, well, you know, we've got all of these complicated, complicated scoring decision rules now maybe these decision rules actually will track the faculty holistic judgments, right? Because, okay, fine, a checklist percent score is not going to track, but if the faculty give us, these are the guidelines that we use, these are the rules that we use to decide, maybe these will track. So we said, good, let's give it a try. What we did is we made a spreadsheet that embedded the decision rules. So the spreadsheet has just the regular checklist, all of that, the, I'm just going to, call our non-clinician raters, I'm gonna call them SPs for short, because most of them are SPs. So, but understand when I'm saying SP here, I'm meaning any non-clinician reader. The, the SP looks at the note and completes the checklist. And you can see that the checklist includes various synonyms, that there is a sort of a lexicon that, that goes with the spreadsheet, right? So heavy pounding or palpitations or racing heart, any of those kinds of phrases would count for this item or SOB, we always write it out, shortness of breath or dyspnea we would have. So we would have lots of different synonyms here and we uh, train the patients for this as well, we can talk about later. So the patient uh, completes the checklist, but also embedded in the spreadsheet, which the patients cannot see, we hide these columns, are the decision rules based on what the uh, faculty told us. And you can see up here, the decision, you know, a complicated decision formula that will say what the score finally is. So based on all of the checklist items that the student, that the SP completes in the, um, in the spreadsheet, it then tells you, okay, now that, now that you've done all of this, now enter into the our, our online thing. The documentation score should be one and the diagnosis score should be two and justification and diagnostic studies should be three. And these numbers correspond to that rubric that I showed you. So that, in that rubric, each of these things was on a four point scale. Okay, uh, any clarification questions about what I've said so far? Okay, see there's two things in the chat. Do I need to look at those, Vina? Yeah, we can see them. Nothing coming up. So nothing coming up. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, moving along. So the research question we asked was, okay, if we do this, if we have these non-clinician readers utilizing the, the, the spreadsheet with the decision rules, so what's the impact on the scores and rate reliability and so on and so forth. 
what happens. So the first study that we did 2017 was just to say, can our non-clinician raters, can they decipher all the different ways that the students are going to phrase things and the jargon they use and the misspellings and the abbreviations and so on and so forth. And so we had eight SPs and eight medics do this. Ooh, did I miss the, uh, I think I missed the poll, alas. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, we had our SPs and our medics score a lot of notes. They each scored about 13 or 14 notes from five different cases. We trained them to all five cases, about one hour per case going over the checklist and all the different ways that the student could phrase something. And then we compared their scores to faculty generated scores, right? And you can see that the overall uh, rate of reliability was quite high, 0 0.87, 0 0.85. So this convinced us that, <coughs> excuse me, in fact, our, our non-clinician readers could decipher what the students wrote to accurately complete the checklist on the notes. The following year, what we did is we had the non-clinician readers score, in fact, score all the notes for our exam, right? And the previous one, they were just, uh, it was a retrospective on previously scored notes. Here we had them score all the notes to, on the exam to the a great delight of our faculty scorers. And the scorers each we scored, <clears throat> excuse me, 30 notes just so that we could compare them. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. So, here we had a little bit different design. We had 10 non-clinician readers, some of them SPs, some of them um, um, uh, skills instructors. I think that I didn't go, let me see if I can't go back here for some reason. Yeah, I think I have to go back through here. Here we go. What I didn't mention here, there was no significant difference between the SPs and the medics. So we had imagined, we, I had imagined, that the, the EMTs and medics would be much better at this than the SPs because the EMTs and medics already are familiar with medical jargon, right? So I thought they would be able to do this much better. It turns out there was in fact no difference. The, the medics did it faster, but the SPs were more careful, okay? I think because of the training that we give them in terms of completing the regular SP checklist, um, where they have to be, you know, the student only gets credit for the checklist item if they do it a certain way, if they ask it a certain way. So they were quite careful in completing the, um, the checklist for the notes and no difference between them in, in reliability. It's not what I was showing over here that has to do with readers versus faculty, but when we broke them down into SPs and medics, no difference, either one will work. Okay. So here we divided them up and just as we used to do for faculty, the notes for each case were divided between two different raters. Uh, we did in, uh, three hours, we, again, that's me. I did a three hour training session with them for each case in pairs. So the two who would be scoring the particular case, I sat with them for three hours, trained them on the checklist for this case. We scored about 10 notes together to make sure that they would be familiar with all the different variations. The other thing we did and, and still do is that when they are scoring, I go online every night and they have a place where they can write questions to me. I wasn't sure how to score X, Y, Z. The student said this, I wasn't sure what this meant. I go in and answer their questions. Okay. If this were machine learning, that would be called human in the loop, I've learned. So I'm the human in the loop here to, to answer the questions. And then what we had was we looked at only those students who failed and we asked faculty to rescore all of those notes, to review all of those notes. And one of the things that the faculty could do is that they could override the formula scores. So they scored the note using the checklist and then, um, then they could say, you know what, according to the formula, the, the students should get a one, you know, the lowest possible score on justification that in fact, I think it wasn't so bad they ought to get it to. And they could override the formula score and, and uh, change the score for that. They also scored 30 other notes or a total of 30 notes, including those four. But the other notes we uh, took uh, stratified, some high scoring students, some medium scoring students, some low scoring students. And then we wanted to compare 
the scores that we got from faculty to the scores that we got from the students using the formula. All right, so here we go. So first of all, just the uh, rater reliability of the non-clinician raters versus faculty raters. And you can see again, overall, very good reliability. Uh, lower for justification. And that was expected because that's where, um, that's where there's the most variation in how the students uh, phrase things and also the most variation in terms of what the faculty think is acceptable. In other words, the justification scores, the checklist only includes the key things for the justification, but many times the students would write things that were not included on the checklist and sometimes the faculty would give credit for that. Now this rate of reliability is especially good if you compare it to the rate of reliability faculty-faculty from a previous study that we did. So that rate of reliability weighted cap of 0.79 here, 0.88, so very good rate of reliability, here. excellent rate of reliability here, I would say. Now we looked at those places where faculty made changes. In other words, where the uh, formula came up with a score of something and faculty overrided those scores. Most of those change, changes happened among the scores of the failing students. So we had four failing students, five cases per student, so a total of 20 notes, and faculty made changes to 10 of those 20 notes, half of those notes, okay? Some of them increased the score, some of them decreased the score. You can see again a lot in the justification section. And overall, those changes meant that three of the students who had failed now passed. Now, if we look at the non-failing students, because right, they, they all did uh, 26 students who did not fail stratified, they made very few changes to those students' notes, to those students' scores, and none of them uh, resulted in any pass-fail change. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We also looked at the time and cost for the non-clinician raters versus faculty raters, right? And you can see that overall, the cost was about half as much per note. So our non-clinician raters, they took much longer, there was much longer training involved. They took much longer to do, actually do the scoring, more than twice as much. Nonetheless, they cost much less, right? So that the total cost was, uh, was about half. Now, this is a little bit misleading because we don't actually pay our faculty to do this. So when our faculty score, they don't get any money for scoring, right? It just costs them in time. So this was a calculation. If you figure time as being worth $100 an hour, maybe time is worth more than that. Right? The $100 an hour we got from the uh, list of the average uh, cost around the country for family medicine physicians. That's where we got that at the time. Okay, so first of all, it costs much less, right? Second of all, look at the time difference, right? So with our faculty, it took us invariably at least a month, often six weeks, sometimes more than six weeks to get all of the note scores. With the non-clinician readers, this was a job for them. They had time set aside for it and they finished it within two weeks of the end of the exam. Nowadays, we finish it within a week of the end of the exam. So much faster, much faster turnaround in terms of feedback to the students. All right, so what were the conclusions here? The, our our non-clinician readers were faster, they cost less, they were as reliable as the faculty in, in scoring these notes. Um, but still we were concerned that the faculty were making changes at the pass-fail boundary, right? Which meant to us that the spreadsheet really did not map well to the decisions faculty were making for the low performing students. So why not, right? Like why, you know, all these complicated guidelines, like why don't they map well, right? And um, a couple of, of thoughts that we had here, we haven't studied it in, in, in detail yet. So this is really just speculation on our part, but you have to think about whether in fact, when the faculty are scoring notes, are they using analytic rules or are they doing holistic scoring, right? And these faculty, especially they've been scoring notes for many years. They are doing pretty much holistic scoring. They've got, they've got rules in their head, but those rules are encapsulated, 
right? They try to generate the rules for us as they generate these guidelines uh, for operationalizing the rubric that in fact, the rules are encapsulated. What does that mean? It means they're automated. They're not necessarily available to their conscious minds. It's like when I went out with my son when he was learning how to drive, right? And we went out to practice driving and he was turning corners and he was doing it wrong. And I gave him all kinds of advice and he took my advice and it was still wrong. And I finally, I said to him, pull over, let me get behind the wheel. I got behind the wheel and I went around the corner and I said, ah, now I see what it is that I do. And I could tell him what to do and he did it right. But that information was not available to my conscious mind, right? That was automated. I could not access it to know what is it that I actually do. I think that's true here of our faculty as well, right? It's, it's unconsciously competent, right? It's automated. They've got rules in their head, but they don't actually know what those rules are. When they sit down and they make those guidelines for us, they're trying to think what those rules are. But in fact, those rules that they come up with, just like my advice on how to turn the corner, don't really map well to what they actually do when they're actually scoring the note. So that's one speculation. The other suspicion I have is that there is some leniency here, all right? So they knew which were the notes of the students who failed when they were scoring those notes, right? And I think they were looking at ways to, to give a little extra credit back to those students. So Rachel, I think there's that, a question in the chat, if you don't mind, that asked, did the faculty please. know that the students had failed when they regraded? They did, okay? So exactly right, that, that's exactly my point. They knew which were the students who failed. They, so uh, I don't remember how it was that we gave them the notes, but like these are the notes of the students who failed. Now please do another 26 notes. They knew who those students were. And I think that there was a, a, a leniency bias uh, then when they were rescoring those notes. Um, I also think that in general, in practice, their logical guidelines tend to be stricter than when they actually apply them to the notes that they that they score. And I've, I've seen that over and over again, where they say like, yeah, yeah, but you know, really they gave a pretty good answer over here. I'm gonna give them credit for it. All right, so the recommendations that, that we were giving at this point was to have non-clinician raters score all of the notes and use those scores to identify the low performing students and then have faculty rescore only those low performing students, maybe 15, 20% of the, of the students uh, where you know the, the cut score is gonna fall somewhere in here, right? And have the student, the faculty rescore those notes. And again, we gave the faculty the, the option of overriding the formula. So what are the consequences? The consequences also is that non-clinician raters could score uh, notes formatively for low stakes exams, right? We were talking here about high stakes, our high stakes summative exam, but for low scores, low uh, stakes exams, maybe the non-clinician raters can score them and give feedback to everybody. And it would be a way of providing some formative feedback that we've never been able to provide before and really conserve the faculty time for remediation, for coaching, for giving detailed feedback and so on, for the things that only they can do. All right, so that was stage one and all of that has been published. So I'm gonna tell you now a little bit about some more recent work that is not yet published. Um, because as we continued working on this, the, you know, the whole point of this was that the faculty scoring was resource intensive, but I've got to tell you that these complex formulas, they're also resource intensive, right? And when we looked at those cost comparisons, we were not putting in any of the development time that went into it. Well, there's a lot of development time that goes in by the faculty to come up with these complicated scoring rules. And then by me looking at their scoring rules and seeing that they do not, they do not fit together logically, they're not you know, exhaustive and exclusive and so on and going back and working with them again. And then developing these formulas and troubleshooting the formulas, I end up scoring at the least 30 um, notes per case as we pilot test and troubleshoot the formulas. 
Okay, so there's a lot of time with that. My research assistant is the one who makes the formulas and so on. So there's a lot of time that goes into making these complex formulas. So the next question is, is there in fact any added value from these complex formulas, right? We think so because we, especially we thought that they were mapping better to the faculty, um, to the faculty holistic scores. So this is gonna be our next question. And I'd, I'd love to just uh, do a poll with you here quickly and see what you think the answer is gonna be. So let's see where we're up to now. This is poll four. All right. So what do you think? Do you think the complex formulas add value beyond the simple check the score or no? All right. Two more seconds. Take a guess, just take a guess. Nobody's gonna hold you to anything here. All right, so here are the results. We're 50, completely 50-50 split, all right? Yes, they are, no, they're not. Okay, so now let's see what, what really happened. And I was split, I gotta tell you, right? And I didn't know what was going to happen. All right, so here we go. The question is to specify it a little bit more. Might simpler scoring, might the simple checklist be equally effective for identifying the low scoring students? All right. So again, we've already conceded that for the low scoring students, we have to have uh, uh, faculty input, but can might, might these two methods be equally good at just identifying what that low scoring group is? So, <clears throat> excuse me, what we did is we took um, notes for five cases that were scored by our standardized patients and medics, and they all scored them on the checklist. And then we took that checklist data, and from them we had the conversion to rubric score we already had. And now we also, uh, created a percent correct score from it. So this is retrospective uh, analysis on data. Just looking to see if we just said, okay, there are 20 history physical exam items in the documentation section, what percent of those items did they get right? And then we also had faculty score 30 notes. Um, uh, stratified, again, so high scores, middle scores, lower scores. The, the faculty did the checklist on the note also, and then we asked them to give us a global rating on the note. Is what, how would you rate this note? Is this a definite fail, a marginal fail, marginal pass, definite pass? So that's the data that we got. Okay, and now let's take a look at that. All right, so the correlation between, first of all, the, oh, let me go back, back. There we go. The correlation between the percent correct scores and the formula rubric scores was very high, 0.88. I have to sort of move your pictures around because they're blocking a little bit. Okay, the correlation between the percent correct score and the global rating score was 0.81. Between the rubric score and the global rating was 0.80. So no difference between the percent correct and formula in terms of correlation with that global rating. A little disappointing, right? I thought for sure this formula rubric score was gonna correlate better with that global rating score, but in fact, not. Now we looked at ability to identify the low performing students. The bottom 10 students were exactly the same ones across both, both systems. If we looked at the whole bottom quintile, about 30 students, um, the percent, the, if we take the formula rubric score, then the percent correct score had 24 of the same students. Six of the students that were in the bottom quintile with formula were in the second quintile with the percent correct score. There was minimal difference in the ranking of the students here and uh, the least difference for the lowest ranking stu uh, students.
let's look at pass fail categorization, right? And we're going to compare here to the global rating score. So percent correct. So uh, for the percent correct in the formula rubric, we had already established with a, an Engoff method, the uh, cut score for the rubric as less than two out of four, which would translate to less than 50% uh, for percent correct score. And for the global rating, we took it as less than two and a half, in other words, midway between marginal fail and marginal pass. Agreement between percent correct and global rating 0.6, between formula and global rating 0.65, so a little bit more, but still bottom line is only moderate agreement here. Let's look at time and cost, right? Formula rubric scores have the checklist and guideline developments. This is faculty, both the case writers and me as consultant to them. About an hour conversion to formula, piloting and troubleshooting, total of about nine hours of faculty time, seven hours of our eight time, <coughs> excuse me, development time per case. For checklist percent score, there's none of that. There's only the initial checklist development, three hours. Cost is different, of course, right? So that's only about one third of the cost. But again, the, the main course here, the main limiting resources is faculty time. So the difference between nine hours per case of faculty time and three hours per case of faculty time is very substantial. Just in terms of sustainability, how, how many things we could do this for. So Rachel changed her mind after all of this. I changed my mind. And I really think now that our non-clinician raters can do it. They can score a checklist and we can use a checklist on the note, which I was also adamantly opposed to. We can use a checklist on the note, at least for this initial phase of identifying the low scoring students and of uh, giving formative feedback. And in fact, now that I changed my mind, I can uh, totally rationalize it, right? Because it's uh, the, the patient note scoring with a checklist like this by non-clinician readers is, is totally comparable to the SP checklist that we do. And for, you know, in, in Europe, they don't like to have SPs do checklists on the, patient, on the data gathering and they have their faculty watching, observing the encounter. And, and giving a holistic rating, uh, you know, a, a rating scale rating that's done by faculty. And I've always justified it. No, we can have our standardized patients do this because all the standardized patients are doing is recording what happened. What did the student ask? And the faculty are determining what is the important things to pay attention to? What are the important uh, things to record? It's exactly the same here. Our faculty are telling us what's important to be in the note. All our non-clinician readers are doing is saying, was this in the note? Was this not in the note? And, and they are able to do that just like SPs can do that for data gathering. So, so where, do I, where do I land now, right? I think absolutely non-clinician readers can supplement faculty to identify the low scoring group and to provide feedback for low stakes formative events. And this conserves faculty time, which is our by far our limiting rate uh, step, right, to review the low performing student notes, to provide additional feedback to those students, to provide coaching and teaching and do what faculty do best. As an added benefit, if we get these global, you know, pass fail scores from, from faculty, we can use those for standard setting instead of using angle for status st standard setting, which has all kinds of problems. We can use those global ratings for standard setting and get a much more solid uh, cut score as well. So many advantages to that. Limitations and caveats, okay? So this is one school, right? This is all coming out of one school and it's a school that has a very long tradition of doing OSCEs and training patients for the OSCEs. And, uh, you know, when we did a lot of radar training here, a lot of time of radar training and I go online every night and check to see if there are questions and answer the questions, which is probably not sustainable either. So. Just have that in mind as, as a caveat as you think about this. Um, but there it is. So, so what are next steps, right? So next step is machine learning, right? So we're doing right now, we have a, a Stemler funded grant 
uh, together with our, our colleagues at the Peoria campus and at the Urbana campus to look at machine learning and can we have machine scoring to do these checklists, right? Uh, again, maybe just to identify the low scoring students, still major, major savings in time. Um, so that's a fun study that we're doing now and, uh, and stay tuned. Uh, what's the bottom line here? The more feedback we can give to our students about what it is they need to do and their clinical reasoning and their thinking, the, the better learning we'll have, the better reasoning we'll have, the better patient care we'll have. That's why we do all of this. That, that's what it's all about. So many thanks to all of you for inviting me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to present this. And uh, we have a, a few minutes for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Yudkaska. That was very, very stimulating and incredible good research. So if you can raise your hand, uh, I will be able to see you and we can uh, have a conversation with Dr. Yudkowski. Uh oh, did I overwhelm everybody with too much detail? No, I don't think so. So what do you think? Does this seem like something that you could do? Are you convinced that I did I change your mind on this or are you still skeptical? And, and if 